I want to speak to you today on the third part in a four-part series on the godly citizen. And today I'm going to bring up a topic that is very controversial in our in our nation but not in the Bible. So, it's not something that we if you read the Bible, you cannot see it any other way than what God outlines. And I want to speak about that today. And I want to talk about the topic, a matter of life. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to read from the book of Jeremiah, the first ten verses of the first chapter. Jeremiah is setting the stage for a prophecy that he is about to write under the unction of God. And he is setting the stage for why he's writing this prophecy. Why he's giving this prophecy. And in Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 1 through 10 it says this. The words of Jeremiah the son of Hilkiah of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon king of Judah in the 13th year of his reign. It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations, and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would add your blessing upon our hearts. God, I pray today that as we learn of your word, as we review what you have to say, about this most critical issue. I pray, dear God, that you would help us to recognize just how critical this issue is in our nation. God, it is an issue that is being brought up in other ways in our land today, and yet, those who are trying to push this topic are skewing it in so many wrong ways. So I pray, dear God, that we hear the truth today and that we study and work to be your voices in this most critical time. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 
In verses 4 and 5, Jeremiah writes, The word of the Lord came unto me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Today I want to talk to you on the topic of matter of life. You see, we are living in a day and time when we are told that a particular race of people, that their lives matter, and they do. Absolutely, their lives matter. And it is very important that we understand that. I am in no way undermining the fact that every life matters. Every life. It doesn't matter whether you're black or brown or yellow, red or white or any shade in between. Doesn't matter. You are created in the image of God. And we will get to that in just a moment. In fact, when we talk about something that is very critical, we say it's referred to, anyway, as a matter of life and death. Why do we say that? Because there is a diametric opposite understood in that statement. Life and death. Scripture at one point God says through his prophet, behold I set before you life and death, so choose life. So many are concerned about this COVID-19 epidemic and its potentially fatal consequences. And, and should be. We don't want to spread this any more drastically than, need, than, than it, it should, or than it, and it shouldn't be at all. But we don't want to see people die as a result of this epidemic. And there's a lot being said right now as we are headed into a very critical election in our nation. And this series is all about being a godly citizen and voting the way that God would have us to vote and looking at the critical elements of what each side is supporting and what each side is opposed to. And one side is really promoting this COVID-19 side and, and trying to just press upon us this the urgency and the fatality that is involved. And, and it is an important thing. It is something we need to take seriously. I have friends of mine that have had it and some have been hospitalized and I believe we need to treat it very seriously. On the other hand, I don't understand why a group that promotes this so heavily is also supporting something that creates death to the unborn. When we are confronted with our mortality, when we are under attack, most of us, I, I think probably 99.9% .9 of us, we resist. We don't want to be killed. We don't want somebody to, to cause us to die. Why? Because life is precious. Life, every life, is precious. In fact, videos of abortions 
that have been captured by ultrasound show that a child in the womb will try and fight against the instruments of the abortionist. Why? Because there is an instinct implanted in every life by God himself to maintain that life. That child in the womb begins to struggle when they are being forcibly removed ahead of time and killed. And somebody said, well, if you see it as murder, then why don't you take the appropriate action? Well, let me get to that in the, in the message. Because I think there are appropriate actions that we need to take. Now let us consider the facts that go beyond this mortal existence and show that life is critical in all stages and in all facets of life. And I'll explain that here in a moment. And we want to reason about the truth that it all comes down to a matter of life. Everything in our planet, everything in our existence comes to the fact that you and I were created in God's image. You and I created in God's image. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. And I'm going to read that again here in a moment. But it says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. He him. Male and female created he them. Mankind. Created. In the image of God. Both. Created. In the image of God. Well how was that? Well you know if we look at Genesis chapter 1. And I'm not going to read all of Genesis chapter 1, but I do have it outlined here, and I do have it highlighted in my message. I'm not going to read all of it, but if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you will find that God said, and there was. God said, let there be light, and there was. And God said, let there be a firmament, and there was. And God said, and God made that firmament, and God spoke it, and it was so. And God spoke it, and it was so. And you will find, as you go through Genesis 1, that God speaks the words, and it even says in some of those instances that He made things like the firmament, and He made the stars in the sky, the sun, and, and all of the other lights. He made the moon. But it doesn't say that he fashioned them. It says he made them. He spoke and it happened. He spoke and God created and God blessed those that he had just created in the sea. And God spoke and he created and he made the animals on the ground and he blessed them and told them to multiply. But when it came to God and man, first of all, the first thing we hear is that God made man in his own image. Very important. And it goes on to explain in Genesis chapter 2 the difference between what happened in Genesis chapter 1 in days 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and the first part of day 6, when he spoke and the animals were created, the difference between how the animals were formed, how the plants were formed, how all of creation was formed, and the difference in how he created man. It says, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Notice there is an intimate movement of God in forming man. 
In the other instances, he spoke and he made and the animals became and the plants became and all of life became. But when it came to making man, it says God formed and then he breathed into man the breath of life. So God formed man out of the dust of the ground and then he breathed into man something he had not done in the other elements of creation. He made you and I different. We live in a day where we are trying to undermine God. We're trying to do away with God. And since the, since the 1800s, when Darwin came out with his theory and he put together his whole ideology of this evolution thing. He's trying to tell us that we were developed over millions of years and that uh, hundreds and thousands of years ago that there was a, a, a movement of elements and somehow when a lightning bolt struck a pile of goo that life began. Do you know that there are experiments going on right now Scientists are trying to throw those elements into this, this machine and they're trying to zap it with electricity and they're trying to, to move it in every way they can imagine and they have been doing this for years and years and years to try to prove evolution and they've never once created new life. Why? Because God is the one who creates New life. It will never happen. I don't care if they zap that goo for a thousand years. It's never going to create life. You have to have the element of the power of an almighty God. And God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And life in the image of God became ultimately precious. We were created in the image of God. We were created to be able to make our own choices. In fact, God very specifically said to man, I have made all of these different trees. I've given you all the fruit of these trees and you may eat of all of that fruit except one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just stay away from that one. All the others. The tree of life is out there for you. And God gave us that choice and we made a bad choice. But even after the bad choice, God said, there's going to be life. I'm going to make a way for life to be, to continue. I'll get to that toward the end of the message. But the second thing I want you to understand is not only were you created in the image of God, you have that special ability to choose. You have that special ability to be able to, to interact and to be able to have a soul and to make those kind of choices. But not only that, but you were created to be you. Now that, that might sound kind of strange, but it's the truth. You were created to be the person you are. We were created to be male and female. And we were created to be the person in that gender that we are. And, I, and, and we were created in, in a very specific design. To be who we are and to stay who we are. And each of us will have our own personalities. Each of us has our own way of, of viewing things. In Jeremiah chapter 1 that I read to you, God tells Jeremiah, before you were formed at all, I knew you. I knew who you were going to be. Before you were ever formed, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I called you. 
I sanctified you. Before you were ever created, I knew you. And I'm calling you now. Don't say I'm a child and I can't speak. He's saying I'm calling you where you are at your point in life and you are to go out and be my mouthpiece. A lot of people don't realize this. I was 17 when I got married. Not because we had to. We were in love. God had put us together. God called us to be who we are. When I was 17, I was already working toward ministry. I, I had graduated from high school. I graduated early from high school. And the Lord had already called me to preach. And I was already working on my ministry license. By the time I was 19 and a half years old, I took my first church as a pastor. I've been a pastor a very, very long time. I've been married 41 years. I've been pastoring 39 years. But what does that say? You see, God told Jeremiah, don't say I am a child. I knew you. I called you before you were ever formed in the belly. I knew you. He could say the same thing about me. Rex Love, I knew you before you were ever formed in your mother's belly. I knew you before you ever broke the womb. I knew you and I called you and I ordained you. I sanctified you. And every one of you here today, God has a purpose for you. He made you who you are. Amen. So be who you are. Now, if who you are is, you know, being cantankerous sometimes, maybe you need to work on that a little bit. That's okay. You know, we need to we need to watch ourselves. We need to be in the love of Christ. We need to live according to the word of God. But but be who you are. Don't be ashamed of being who you are. And God not only called you to be you, but he called you for a purpose. And that's what he told Jeremiah. You see, in Psalm number 139, if you read through that, you can go through the whole chapter of Psalm 139 at some point. But the psalmist says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, God put you together for you to serve a purpose, to be the person God formed you to be. It's very important that we understand that. And it doesn't matter the color of our skin. When I was a little boy, we used to sing the chorus, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And I would take that a step further. Jesus loves all people of the world. His desire is that every one of us lives according to his plan and his purpose and his design that he has called us to. God called you for a purpose. You say, well, I'm not a pastor like you are. No. God doesn't call. If, if we were all pastors, what, what good would that do? The Bible tells us about that. It says we're all part of the body of Christ. We're all members, separate members. And he called some to be apostles and some prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And he's called others to be other, other pieces of the body. Now I'll tell you what, I'm glad God created Leon to be a Leon. I mean that. Because let me tell you something. He didn't call me to be Leon. I would have destroyed that furnace this week instead of fixed it. And Janet knows that to be true. She may be watching this at some point. I want to tell you right now, she calls in professionals in our house on some things. And you know why? Because Pastor Rex doesn't have it. I'm all right at putting together messages and praying and, and, and working on the telephone during the week. I'm all right at being a customer service representative.
But what I'm trying to say is, God has called every one of us for a different purpose. Our lives matter, not because of the color of our skin. Our lives matter because we are made in the image of God, called to be who you are, called for a purpose, called for His divine work, for His divine purpose. And I thank God for every one of you that is hearing this because you are who you are, because God made you who you are and gave you your abilities, gave you your, the understanding in some of these areas. He developed your life, and I thank God for that. In fact, he goes on to say in Esther chapter 4, you all know this story, Esther ends up becoming queen. She becomes queen. And there is set a day because of those that are conspiring against the Jews. There comes a day when they set a certain day that the Jews are to be slaughtered. And Esther tells her uncle, because her uncle approaches her and says, you need to go to the king and get this turned around. And she says, you know, the king hasn't called me in. And if I go in there unannounced, he's liable to kill me. Do you know what happened to the last queen? Read the story. The last queen, she didn't fare so well. She, she was killed. The king... Had her killed. And here's new Queen Esther saying, if I go in there unannounced, he has the right to kill me. Do you not know what happened to the last queen? Now, I realize this isn't the King James version of the story, but, but this is the truth. And Mordecai says to her, you need to do what God has purposed you to do. He created you for a purpose. He put you where you are for a reason. And he says, if you hold your peace at this time, then there will be an enlargement and deliverance that will arise from another place. But you and your father's house will end up being destroyed. But who knows? Whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I am here to tell you today, we are living in a very difficult time. But God chose you. He trusted you. He believed in you. He created you to be in this time, in this place, in this moment for such a time as this. And your life matters because of it. You see, God created you for a purpose. And he created you to be an eternal being. But he created you to be eternal. When he breathed into you the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Then you became an eternal being. And yes I know that God told Adam and Eve. If you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that day you will surely die. Well, he didn't say you'll drop over dead. What he said, if you look at the original Hebrew on that, he said you will lose the eternal life of your body. Your body will begin to die. And every one of us ever since then has been having to deal with that. Tell you something, you were created to be eternal, and God expects you to live your life in a way that He can bless you and move in your life today. And He wants to bless you with good life and long life. But the critical nature of this is that at some point in the future, we are going to face our Creator, and we better be ready because if we're not, we will spend eternity somewhere. And people don't like hearing that, but it's the truth. And we need to be ready to meet our maker. You see, you were created to be eternal. You were created to continue on in an eternity in God's presence. That's what he wanted in the very beginning. Now, I said a few moments ago that Janet and I we love each other and we are very, very much 
in a relationship that continues on and, and it's been great, but we both know who's number one in our life, in our family, and that's God. You see, the key verse of the Bible, the golden text of the Bible is John 3, 16. Well, why? Because it says, God loved this world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him will not perish, will not be separated from God, but they will have everlasting life. And it's so important we understand that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter is talking to the church about the fact that some people say, well, the Lord's delaying his coming. He's not, you know, it's been so long and Jesus said he'd come back and, and everything just keeps going on the way it is. And then I just don't understand this. And Peter says, you know, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. He will return. But he is long-suffering to mankind and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's, he's continuing to give man opportunity to come to everlasting life. It's so important to understand. Because it is a matter of life. It's a matter of life. Our life matters to God. And because our life matters to God, lives should matter to all of us. Now I'm going to talk up here a few minutes. I'm going to try to draw this to a close, but God said, before I formed you in the belly, he told Jeremiah, I read it to you earlier, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Now I called you and I sanctified you and I ordained you. Before you took your first breath, you were already called to be someone special, a prophet. You were called to speak the word of God. Don't call yourself a child. I've called you out. I've put my word in your mouth. Now, as I said earlier, it doesn't matter who you are or what you are as far as what God's calling on your life is, your abilities are divinely inspired and you can use them to proclaim the truth of the word of God. Because you'll reach people that I'll never reach from a pulpit or through a book that I've written. Before I formed you in the belly. Now what does that turn around to though? Well, it turns around to the fact that all life is precious from early from, from conception to the grave. The Bible talks about life and tells you that it is so important that life continues in you. That you're to honor your father and mother so that your days may be what? Prolonged on the earth. God in his word continually tells us how to live life in a way that life continues. Ephesians chapter 2 says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has ordained and we should walk in. Now, it means that our life from the very moment of conception is important. And this is why it is so critical that we make sure that our country understands this. We are going through some things right now, I believe, because as a nation, we have killed babies since 1973. At will. For convenience sake. If you follow through the Bible, you will find that the reason God brought such devastation upon Israel is because they were sacrificing their children on the altars of Baal and Moloch and others so that their crops would be blessed. So that their homes 
would be blessed for economic purposes. Let me tell you something. God cherishes life, every one of us, before we're conceived. Now, someone might say, well, pastor, I was involved in, a, in an abortion. I, I encouraged an abortion. I had an abortion. God forgives. He is a forgiving God. He is amazing that way. So let's start from today and recognize how important life is. Amen. Okay, so you've been involved in some of these things. Okay, I'm not saying it was a good thing. I'm saying we serve a loving and living God. And if America, who has allowed this, would turn back, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Janet sent me a text just before I took the pulpit today. She sent me a text that said that the United States of America has entered into an agreement and signed an agreement with several other countries, and I can't remember the exact number. I'm going to try to find it really quick. But has entered into an agreement with 32 other countries against abortion. Now, how could we do that? Because there are some leaders in this nation that believe in life right now. And there is a loud cry against those people. They don't want Supreme Court justices that believe in a holy God because they're afraid that their rights might be taken away. I am telling you right now today, you have no right to snuff out a life no matter how young it is. And I'm telling you this direct from the Word of God. The blessings of God are children. It says in God's Word in the book of Psalms that, that blessed is the man who has a quiver full of children. And I know this is not popular and this is something that people just don't believe we should preach. We should have pastors in our pulpits that will make us feel all gooey and warm and make everything just feel all wonderful and fluffy. But I am here to tell you today the Word of God is clear and distinct that life matters at all levels, at all times, and God wants us to preserve life at all costs. Amen. And abortion is wrong. It's a matter of life. It's a matter of life. I had the blessing and privilege of dedicating little Caroline, my newest grandchild, my granddaughter, a couple of Sundays ago, thank goodness it wasn't today, with it being like zero temperatures, or it feels that way. We had a very warm Sunday afternoon, and I was able to go out to a park with the family, and, and I performed her dedication out at that park. And when I was there, before her dedication, I read out of a prayer journal that I have. It's now a prayer journal. It was just a journal that I was keeping but on June the 15th, the year before she was born, I wrote in that journal because my daughter Stephanie and her husband had been trying to have another child. They already had a little boy, wonderful little boy, but they were very discouraged because they just couldn't, they, they just couldn't have a child. They, they were just, they were trying to, and every month that rolled around, she realized she wasn't having a child, and she, it was discouraging to her. They really wanted another child. And in my prayer journal in the middle of June, last year, 
2019. My prayer journal, I wrote, Dear God, I come to you today with a great request. My daughter Stephanie wants a child so badly. And she is so discouraged. God, I ask that you would give her a child. And that by this time next year, I actually wrote in there by May of next year, that you'll give her a child that will be born by May of next year and God, I ask that it would be a little girl with her mother's personality. And God, I know you'll do this. And so I just put it in your hands and I thank you ahead of time for my new granddaughter. That was the middle of June last year. Several weeks later, we were gathered at a family gathering and, and they had worked it out so that Stephanie would announce that she was expecting a child. And I started to cry. And they were all looking at me like I had just lost my mind. And I started to cry, I started to weep. They said, Dad, are you all right? I said, it's going to be a girl. It's going to be a girl. And they were looking at me and they were like, Dad, let's just. No, no, you don't understand. I asked God for this child. It's in my prayer journal at home. It's going to be a little girl. And, and the family were kind of like, Okay, Dad, all right, sure. Just a few weeks later, when they were able to tell what the gender was, my daughter called me. She said, Dad, my little girl's on her way. Well, actually, it may have gone a different way. She they might have had a gender reveal, I don't know, but I remember talking to her and her telling me, Dad, the little girl's on her way. Amen. And you know what God did? Because he's God and he can. On my birthday this year, that little girl was born. So not only did God give me my granddaughter as I asked, but she was born on my birthday. You think God doesn't care about life? You think God doesn't care about the birth of children? You think God doesn't care? I am here to tell you today. He does care. And he's an amazing and big God. And he's looking at America right now. And he's asking us, what are you going to do to correct what is going on in your nation? And it's time to vote for life. I'm not telling you how to vote. But I think I'm being fairly clear about which side is promoting what. I won't stand up here and tell you how to vote. I won't do that. But I will tell you, vote life. It's a matter of life. And God wants us to have life. He wants children that are unborn to continue in life. And I believe some of what we're seeing in this nation is because we have done this so terribly since 1973. Now, I've got to close. I am way over time. But I want to say this. I did some research. And for the first time since 1973, when they started tracking these statistics, because the Supreme Court allowed abortion beginning in 1973. And since that time, for the first time since that time, 
the number of abortions have dropped below the 1973 level since 2014. 2014. Is abortion good at all? No. But thank God the numbers are dropping. We need to pray for revival in America. And we need to let every American know that all lives matter. From conception to the grave. We need to honor that life. And let God have his way in our life. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today and I thank you, dear Lord, for this time. And God, I, I know that you are watching over us today and that you care about every life. I thank you for the lives of all that are here and all that are listening, all that will be watching. I pray, dear God, that you would allow your word to pierce into our very soul to change this land. God, I repent on behalf of America. I repent for the millions of lives that have been lost by elective abortion. And I pray, dear God, that you would give us as the people of God the courage to stand and, and, and stand for life no matter who we have to stare at, who we have to face them. God, you told Jeremiah... Not to worry about being young. Not to worry about looking into the face of whoever he had to challenge. And God, I pray today that those words would ring in our hearts. Help us to stare into the face of all who oppose life. And to speak the truth. And to bring this about. God, I pray for those that may hear this word and might repent of what they have done in this area in their lives. God, forgive them and heal them and lift them up, bring them into your kingdom, I pray. God, I pray today that this church and our families, our community would be where it starts. Let it start here! May we be a people that will raise up a battle cry on your behalf. Let us be a people that will share your word regardless of the cost. Bring us back to you, I pray. God, I pray for the election in a, another week and a half. You are sovereign, and so we put it in your hands. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen.